Um, well, I guess that didn't, still we still have a little bit more people in there, so I'm just checking, is everyone in the right room? Because um, in case you're not sure, this is, this is a sponsor session, it means that like, we, um, we work for a company that sponsored the conference. That's why we, we didn't do the um, um, call for papers process, so I'll talk might not be very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, just kidding. I, like it's always very flattering, and like we really appreciate it when people come out to support us. We uh, we work for a company called Skylight. We make a um, Rails performance monitoring um, product. Um, well, called Skylight. You can find it at skylight.io, and if you can remember that URL there, there's a promo code that you can use that gives you fifty bucks off, which is pretty good deal. Um, and if you can't remember that URL, no problem. We have a booth at the exhibit hall tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. Um, so you can just come talk to us at the booth and we'll um, hook you up with the discount and everything. Um, in case you haven't used Skylight before, this is what it looks like. Um, but again, we have a booth, so I'm not going to waste your time here. We're just going to dive right into our talk. Um, Okay, so um, who here has written a Rails app before? <laughs> uh, just checking. Um, cool, so most of the room here are Ruby programmers, Rails developer, right? So like you've probably written some code similar to this at some point where you have a controller and you have like a index method or you have a show method or whatever and inside the method is just Ruby, right? Like we know how Ruby works, we know like maybe you put post.find there, but like we can understand off that post is a class, find is a class method, so post.find calls that method, blah, blah, it's just all Ruby through and through. But have you ever wondered how did we get here in the first place? Like when you type skylight.io slash hello in the browser, how did it how did it make all the way to your index method? Who calls that? And how does a web request get turned into something inside Ruby? That's what this talk is going to be about. And to tell you more about that, we have SEC. So let's say you are meeting somebody for lunch. Uh, meet at Pastini probably works for your coworkers who go there a lot but it probably doesn't work for your out-of-town friend who's not familiar with the area. Instead, you can give them the street address. That way they can give it to their cab driver or just ask anyone for directions. Computers work much the same way. Skylight.io is easier for us to remember, but it doesn't help your computer find the server. When you type skylight.io in your browser, the first order of business is to connect to the server and to figure out how to get there, they need to translate that name into an address. For computer networks, this is the IP address, and it looks like this. Um, you've probably come across it at some point. Uh, with this kind of address, computers can navigate the interconnected networks of the internet and find their way to their destinations. DNS, which stands for Domain Name System, is what helps our computers translate the domain name into the IP address that they use to find the correct server. You can try it for yourself with a command line tool called dig on your computer. The output looks a little bit intimidating, but the main thing to look at here is that it translated skylight.io into 34.194.84.73. The DNS is a registry of domain names mapped to IP addresses. When you buy or own a domain, you are in charge of setting up and maintaining this mapping, otherwise your customers can't find you. Okay, so once we have the IP address of the server, our browser can connect to it. The way the browser connects to the server is actually pretty interesting. 
you can think of opening a connection between the two, like picking up a phone and dialing someone's number. In fact, why don't we try it? There's another program on your computer called Telnet that lets you open a raw connection to any server. Here we are connecting to the server we found earlier on port 80, which is the default HTTP port. Once we have connected, we have to say something, but what do we say? Hi. Unfortunately, that doesn't get you very far. What do you do when you pick up the phone and it sounds like a spam call? You hang up. So let's try this again, but this time doing it properly. The browsers and the servers have to agree on a language for speaking to each other so that they can understand what one another is asking for. This is where HTTP comes in. It stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, which is the language that both browsers and web servers can understand. To make the request for skylight.io slash hello, here is the simplest request that we could make. It specifies that it is a get request for the path slash hello using the HTTP protocol version 1.1 and is for the host skylight.io. A simple response from the server looks like this. It specified that the request was successful, gives a bunch of header information, and finally, hello world, the text we rendered from the controller. HTTP is a plain text protocol as opposed to a binary protocol, which makes it easy for humans to learn, understand, and debug. It provides a structured way for the browser to ask for web pages and assets, submit forms, handle caching, compression, and other mundane details. And by the way, here's a side note. Uh, just like your phone line, the connection between the browser and the server is unencrypted. The request goes through a lot of places to get to the other side, the conference Wi-Fi, uh, the convention centers, routers, our internet provider, the server's hosting company, and many other intermediate networks in between that help forward the request along to the right place. This means a lot of parties along the way have the opportunity to eavesdrop in on the conversation, but maybe you don't want others to know what, you're, what conversation you're having. No problem, you can just encrypt the contents of the conversation. It will still pass through all of the same parties and they will still be able to see that you are sending each other messages, but those messages won't make sense to them because only your browser and the server have the keys to decrypt them. This is known as HTTPS. The S makes it secure. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not a different protocol from HTTP. You're still speaking the same plain text protocol that we saw earlier, but before, the browser sends the message out and encrypts it, and before the server interprets the message, it decrypts it. The encryption decryption is done by using a secret key that both the browser and the server have agreed upon and no one else knows about. But how do the browser and server pick what keys to use for encryption and decryption without giving them away while all the other parties are listening in? Well, that's a topic for another talk. <laughs> okay, so by now your browser has successfully connected to the server, and asked it for a specific web page. How did it generate the response? To tell you about that, let's push Vidahi on the stack. Oh, thank you, Zach. All right, so that is a good question. How did it generate this response? Well, first of all, we have to figure out what kind of server this is. Well, it's a web server, which really just means that it speaks HTTP, as we saw earlier. So there are quite a few different examples of web servers. Here are a few. We have Apache, Nginx, Passenger, LightD, Unicorn, Puma, and even WebBrick. Some of them are written in Ruby, while others are written in C. And their job is really just to parse, which just means understand, what the request is. And they have to make a decision about how to service that request. For simple requests, like serving static assets, you can easily configure a web server to do that for you. So for example, let's say that we wanted to tell the web server that whenever a browser requests anything in assets, then the web server should try to find that file in my app's public assets folder. And if it exists, it should serve that with compression. Otherwise, it should return a 404 not found page. Depending on which web server you're using, there are specific configuration syntaxes and languages that you might want to rely upon. For example, if you're using Nginx, you probably would write something that looks like this config file. 
For more complicated things, however, it gets trickier. For example, we might want to tell our web server, hey, whenever a browser goes to slash blog, I want you to go to the database, find the 10 most recent blog posts, and then make them look pretty, and then show some comments, and maybe throw in a header and a footer and some JavaScript and some CSS, and off you go. Easy, right? Well, this is maybe a little too complicated to express in the web server's configuration language, but that's what we have Rails for. So really what we wanna do is tell our web server that it needs to hand these types of requests off to Rails for further processing. But how is the web server going to communicate with Rails? Well, in Ruby, there are lots of different ways to communicate this kind of information. So Rails could potentially register a block with a server, or the server could call a method on Rails, and the server could pass that request information along as request arguments, environment variables, and maybe even a global variable. And if we did end up going down this path, what kind of object would these look like? And then of course, there's another question to answer on the flip side, which is how Rails would communicate back to the web server. Ultimately, all of these options actually work. And at the end of the day, what's more important is not which option you pick, but rather that everyone is agreeing on the same option. It's important that we all agree to the same conventions. And that is why Rack was born to present a unified API for web servers to communicate with Ruby web frameworks and vice versa. By implementing the Rack protocol, all web servers, only, all they have to do really is just implement a single adapter for Ruby. And any one Ruby framework that conforms to this convention will just work seamlessly with these web servers. So Rack is just a simple Ruby protocol and all that means is it's a convention. And Rack does a few different things. So first, the web server needs to tell the web framework, hey, I have a request for you to handle. And by the way, here are like the deets for the request. You know, the path, the HTTP verb, the headers. And then the framework needs to tell the server, it's cool, I handled it. Oh, and also here's your result your status code, your headers, the body. In order to remain lightweight, lightweight and framework agnostic, Rack picked the simplest possible way to do this in Ruby. It does a few different things, like it notifies the web framework using a method call, and it communicates the details in the form of method arguments. The web framework communicates back by responding with some sort of return value from that method call. In code, it looks a little bit like this. We see that the web server prepares a hash, which conveniently is called the env hash. The env hash contains all the headers and a path. So for example, we'll see that request method contains the HTTP verb, for example, get or post, path info, as it's named, contains the path request, and HTTP underscore star has the corresponding header value. An important thing here is that your app has to implement a call method. And again, we see convention at work here because the server is going to expect that call method to exist. Why? Because the server invokes the app's call method with the env hash as the argument that's passed in. The app will process the request based on the information in the env hash, and it'll return an array with exactly three things in it. Pro tip, another way to refer to this is a tuple of three. So what are the three things in this tuple of three? First, you have the HTTP status code, which is just a number. Second, you have the headers hash. And finally, you have the body. Now, intuitively, we might think that the body should just be a string, but it's actually not. For some technical reasons, technical reasons, <laughs> the body is actually just an eachable object. 
as in it just needs to implement the each method and it yields strings. In a very simple case though, you can just expect it to be returned as an array with a single string in it. So let's see this in action. To guide us through the Rack API, I'm gonna call on Godfrey. Right, so um, like the goal of the talk is to understand Rails and then forget that, but before we get into Rails, let's just try to use this Rack API that we learned by itself, right? So um, let's say we write a simple Rack app. This is probably one of the simplest Rack app that you can write. Um, you can see that as an object. It has a call method on it. It takes an env hash and it checks what is in the env hash, right? So specifically, it looks at the path of the request. If the path is slash hello, then it's gonna render 200 response. That's the status code. 200 stands for a successful request. Um, and as we said, we need to return an array with three things in it. The first thing is 200. The second thing is a hash of headers. In this case, we want to tell the browser this is a plain text, so don't bother trying to interpret it as HTML or anything like that. And finally, the third thing is an array of the body, in which case we're returning a plain text, hello world. Um, and so else, if um, the path is anything else other than hello. We're gonna do a 404, I'm sure you have encountered that in the past, 404 stands for not found, right? So we're just gonna do a very simple uh, plain text response of not found if you go to anywhere other than slash hello. Um, okay, so now that we have written our app, how do we use it? How do we call it? How do we make it do things? Well, um, as we said earlier, Rack is really just a convention, just a protocol, right? Like you notice that this didn't have to subclass from anything specific. It just has, like it, it can just be any object that responds to call. Um, so to hook that up to HTTP requests, you need a web server, again, as we talked about earlier. Um, so we can hook this up with Nginx or Apache, but um, fortunately for this kind of simple demonstration, Rack came with, um, a pre-built script that's kind of like a web server that natively under like a Ruby web server that natively understand the Rack protocol called RackUp. Um, to configure the web server, um, you can use a config.ru file. It's basically a Ruby file with some extra DSL. Um, so you can see that the first thing we're doing in this config.ru file is to require the app file that we have up there. And the only other thing in there is to run hello world.new. So run is the keyword in the DSL that tells uh, rack up, hey, this is the app, the thing on the right hand side, in this case, hello world.new, which is an object with a dot call on it, as we said a couple of times by now. So finally, to really put all of these together to run it, um, you can just run the command rack up from the same directory where config.ru is, you can see under the hood, RackUp just wraps whatever uh, Ruby web server you have. Sometimes it uses Thin, sometimes it uses WebRick. Um, but that's implementation details, right? Like as far as, we can cons as far as we're concerned, RackUp is a web server that understands config.ru, which understands Rack apps. So now, if we open the browser, go to localhost 9092, sorry, 9292, um, slash hello, we are gonna get the hello world response. And if we go to anything else like so my god or slash wet, we're gonna get our not found. Great, we have written a rack app. So um, now let's make it do a little bit more, right? Like let's say we want it so that when you go to uh, locals 1992 slash, right now you get a not found because slash is not slash hello. Um, so why don't we make slash redirect to slash hello? So to do that, you'll probably modify your rack app to be something like that, right? Um, the part to focus on is <clears throat> if we, we first check if path info is slash, we return a 301 response code, which is a response code for a permanent redirect. Um, and in the headers, we return the location of the redirect, which is slash hello. So this works, it works great. If you open the browser now, go to slash, it will redirect you to slash hello, everything is awesome. Um, however, uh, as you can imagine, if you keep adding things to here, this if statement is gonna get pretty big, right? Like, um, as you have more pages, this is, like, you're gonna have, like, a 100 line if statement. And also, redirect is a pretty common thing that you might want to use in different parts of your app, so 
would be great if we can extract this into a reusable, composable piece of code. And we can do that. So magic, there's more code on the screen now. Um, on the bottom, it's exactly the same Hello World app that we had on the previous screen without any concerns about the redirect, right? Like we, we can see that Hello World is back to the state that it was. It doesn't need to know anything about um, redirects. <clears throat> and we made a new class on top called redirect that is only responsible for handling um, the redirect aspect of the app. So in you can see that in the call method, we first check if the path is, matches what we want to redirect from, then we'll intercept the request and return like right away and just tell the browser to redirect them. That would be it. However, if it doesn't match where we want to redirect from, then we're just gonna delegate to the app that's passed in to us to do more processing. And to wire everything up, it's gonna look something like this, right? Like we, this time instead of passing hello world.new to run, we're gonna pass redirect.new, but passing hello world.new to that redirect app that we made earlier. So this is great and it works. And in fact, we just made our uh, first rec middleware. You might have heard of that word before. This is exactly what it is. Um, rec middleware is not, necessarily, part, like the, unlike the rack app call protocol, um, the middleware is not like a concrete concept in the rack spec. It's just a very useful convention. Like basically as far as the web server is concerned, there's no middleware, right? Like there's just one app with a dot call on it. What you choose to do inside your dot call is up to you. And in the case of a middleware, it just happened to choose to sometimes forward it to a different app, right? That's really it. But because of how useful this um, middleware convention is, the rackup config.rudsl has a special syntax for that. Um, so basically the only problem with this here is that the nesting gets a little bit uncanny and you can imagine if we want a lot of middleware, that right-hand side is gonna look like um, a very deeply nested thing. And so, the rack up DSL has a way for you to flatten it. Basically, instead of uh, run, you can use the use keyword to specify a list of middlewares before um, you specify the app. So this is pretty powerful. Um, the rack gem itself ships with a bunch of very useful middleware that you can um, add to your app. So for example, something like this, um, basically without writing a lot of, like without writing any code really, um, you have added compression to your app, you have added um, HTTP caching to your app, and you have handled head responses. So that's the power of, um, that's power of the middleware convention, right? So to recap, this is like the whole rack concept, basically, we have learned it all. And so it's now time to go back to Rails. So um, the whole point of this detour into Rack is to say that web servers uses the Rack protocol to communicate with um, Ruby web frameworks. So therefore, it must mean that Rails implements the Rack protocol, right? Like otherwise, what's the point of this detour? And it does indeed. Um, if you look at your Rails app, you will see that um, Rails actually generated a config.ru file for you. You can check it out in your work app later. Um, but it probably looks something like this, right? Like it has one single, well, other than the require, um, it has one single line called run rails.application. So we know that um, the convention for the way that the rack up DSL works is the thing you pass to run is a rack app. So therefore, it must mean whatever rails.application is, it must be a rack app, right? So let's try that. So you can try that by running the Rails console, and we can just do rails.application.call, right? Uh, ah, but the problem is, in order to call a rack app, we have to pass it to env hash. Obviously, we can just build the env hash by hand, but this is pretty a lot of work and pretty error prone, right? Like you have to really carefully read the rack spec to make sure you're passing all the things that is expected to be there. But fortunately, rack has a utility um, for exactly this purpose, 
It's called rack mock request dot and for, and you can just pass it a URL and it will build the corresponding um, end hash for you, which is very useful for testing and stuff. So now that we have the end hash, we can try calling rails.application.call again. So if we do that, you'll see that it kind of does what you expected. Like it might be a little bit surprising, but it actually worked, right? Like when you did Rails application a call, it actually ran, it actually ran your entire Rails app, including giving you the um, logging output that you're um, probably familiar with. And it returned, as we mentioned earlier, returned an array of three things. If you're not familiar with that syntax, that's how you can conveniently destructure the array from the return value and assign names to them. Um, so if you look at what the status is, well, it's 200. Um, if you look at the headers, it's among the things as content type in there and other, a bunch of other headers that Rails added for you. And if you look at the bodies, again, body is an array, so takes a little bit more work to look at it. But um, if you print it out, you will see that it's the HTML response that you expected. So that's pretty cool. We found the Rails app, like the Rails Rack app integration point. Um, but if you look at config.ru, you remember that earlier we said there's two things you can put in a config.ru. You can put run and give it an app, but you can also um, specify your middlewares there, right? Like that's what the use keyword is for. Um, and you see, you can see that there's no use keyword, so this Rails not use any middlewares. Well, it turns out Rails just handle middlewares differently, but if you want to look at the Rails middlewares, you can run bin Rails um, middleware, and it will give you all of the middleware and the syntax that you're familiar with. Um, you can see that Rails implemented some of its internal features in um, middlewares. This is pretty cool because um, if you don't need some of these features, you can just take it out. So for example, if you are writing uh, an API server, you might not be using cookies, right? Um, so it doesn't mean that you're stuck with it, um, even though you don't need it. Um, you can just remove it by in your configuration, um, config slash application.rb. Um, you can use the config the middleware that delete and it will remove it from the stack and now you have removed the part of Rails that cares about cookies. So seems great. Um, you can of course also add your own middleware there too. Um, so this is pretty useful for um, some use case that you might have that you might want to wrap around the whole request. So finally, um, we have looked at all the middlewares but what's the app, how does it get to the controller action? For that, we have Kristen to tell you more about that. So we know that use is for middleware and run is for the app. I see run on that last line. So that must be the app, right? Well, what is it? Application.routes. Well, we know that it should be a rap, rack app, so let's try it. So, yep, it's a rack app. As you can see, we call Blorg application routes instead of Rails application call, but otherwise it's the exact same example as before. So what does this Rack app do? It looks at the URL and matches it against a bunch of routing rules to find the right controller action to call. It's generated from your config slash routes.rb file. I hope that looks pretty familiar. The resources DSL is shorthand for defining a bunch of routes at once. Ultimately, it expands into these seven routes. For example, when you make a get request to posts, it will call the post controller index method. If you make a put request to post slash ID, it will go to the post controller update method instead. So what is this post hash index? Well, we know that it stands for the index action on the post controller. If you follow that code, you will see that it eventually expands into the post controller dot action called with index. What is that? Here's a much simplified version of the action controller code. First of all, we have the action method. You can see that it returns a lambda. The lambda takes an argument called env. What's that? Surprise, it's a hash. And what does the lambda return? An array. And by the way, surprise, lambdas respond to call. Yep, it's a rack app. 
Everything is a rack app. Finally, putting everything together, you can imagine that the Routes app is a rack app that looks something like this. It matches the given request path and HTTP verb against the rules defined in your Routes config and then delegates it to the appropriate rack app on the controllers. Good thing you don't have to write this by hand. Thanks, Rails. Now you might be wondering, how does Rails generate this from your Routes config in order to do the mapping efficiently? Well, there's a talk for that. Check out Vitae's talk from last year's RailsConf for more information. Okay, now we know that hashtag everything is a rack app. And we can mix and match things. Here's some pro tips. Did you know that you can route a part of your Rails app to a rack app just like that? In fact, now that we learned about lambdas, you can even write that in line. You may think it's a terrible idea, but in fact, you've probably used this functionality before. How do you think redirect works? Surprise, it's a rack app. You can even mount a Sinatra app inside a Rails app. You may not know this, but the Sidekick web UI is written in Sinatra, so you may already have a Sinatra app running inside your Rails app. Of course, you can also go the other way around and mount a Rails app inside your Sinatra app, but we'll leave that to your imagination. This is also another thing you can do. Remember that controller.action method. And I wouldn't recommend actually doing this in your Rails app because it bypasses auto load and some performance optimizations. It's really cool to know how everything fits together. Okay, after all that, we finally made it back to that controller action that we started with. To summarize, everything is a rack app. Oh wait, how does that render plane thing work? Well. Maybe come to our talk next year, as so we're kind of running out of time. <laughs> Speaking of trolls, here's Yehuda to talk about how Skylight fits into this story. So as we learned so far, frameworks aren't magic. They are just a layer of conventions that live on top of a nice primitive under the hood that works really well. Um, conventions can help you learn, uh, can help you collaborate with your team, and we all love conventions or we wouldn't be here. But more than that, conventions give the community the ability to write tools that everyone can share. For example, Skylight needs to wrap around our entire request so we know how long it took. Well, if we've been paying attention, we know how to do that. We use a middleware. What better way than a middleware? Convention over configuration is more than how you build what Rails apps, it also allows Skylight to give you a lot of detailed information without having to configure anything. So in a lot of ecosystems, tools like Skylight would require you to do a bunch of work to get things running. But because Rails provides such good conventions, we can leverage those in order to make your life easier, to make the, the getting started story easier for you. Um, earlier on, we saw how Rails dispatches actions, but we skipped over this part at the bottom. You may or may not know this, but Rails has a built-in instrumentation system and we can get detailed information about what's going on inside of our requests without hacking into private APIs. For example, this section over here is how we get the name of your endpoints without you having to tell us anything about what they're called. Now, Skylight does way more than just give you the average of the response time for your request. We give you detailed aggregate traces of your entire request. We leverage active support notifications and Rails conventions to provide conventional descriptions for Rails and for common gems without any configuration. Um, by default, we also show you important parts of the request so you can focus on speeding up what matters. So if you look at this example over here, that big, I don't know if you can see the color, but I think it's purple or something. Um, you should probably focus on the app serializer because that's taking up so much of the time if you want to speed up this endpoint. But we still collect way more information that we hide by default. So if you uncheck the condensed trace checkbox at the top, you can see that each middleware that we saw before is here in the expanded trace. And as you can see from this screen, everything is a rack app. Now there's way too much stuff to tell you about in this talk, like the fact that we do a ton of our work in Rust, and by the way, we have official background job support this year, but come to our booth to hear more about that and chat. Um, let's see, is Leia here? I don't think so, okay. Um, I will do this part. So that's that's uh, the life cycle of a request. Um, I hope that was interesting for you. And like Kristen said, maybe next year we'll do a life cycle of a response or something. Um, 
But um, yes, we're hiring. If that kind of stuff, digging deep into Rails and integrating with Rails, measure people's app, like having a thing that running that's running in everyone's Rails app interests you, we're hiring. Um, we have great perks. Um, you, yes, you can come as it at the booth. We are a pretty small company. We have eight people, seven. seven. We have seven people in total, and the downside of that. We want eight people. Yes, we want, <laughs> yes, there you go. We want eight people. Um, come be the eighth person. Um, we, um, we, we started doing this last year, but we're like having the entire company come to do this presentation and really appreciate meeting all customers or future potential customers in, in this talk um, and at the booth. Um, Peter, who is another engineer that we have, um, couldn't make it last minute due to some travel mishap and Leia is here, but currently um, handling a baby situation somewhere. Um, the downside of a small company is like when one or two people couldn't make it, it's like 20, 30 percent of your company, right? But um, but that's also the fun part. You get to know um, each other really well and work to like work very closely with each other. So um, looking forward to seeing you at the booth tomorrow and sign up for Skylight. Thank you very much.